So much media, so little time. Who keeps track of it all? That would be me. This is Bob Andelman, and this is a Mr. Media Interview, broadcast and recorded live on blogtalkradio.com from the new media and baseball capital of the world, Go Rays, St. Petersburg. We've never met, but somehow, some way, Jody Thomas has written the story of my life in her latest novel, Tall, Dark, and Texan. As long-time listeners will know, I grew up in the 1800s on Whispering Mountain in Texas. I was tall, dark, and mostly silent, scaring off small children and even hardened criminals until I found the love of a good woman. Are any of you buying this? <laughs> I'm lying, of course, but I have to admit that I like the idea of secretly being Keegan McMurray, the strong and silent type at the center of Jody's new novel, the latest in her Whispering Mountain series. Jody, welcome to Mr. Media. Well, thank you. I'm glad to be here. I'm glad to be lying. <laughs> <laughs> I thought that was funny. <laughs> now, don't you don't you think that you could create, you know, in maybe your next next uh, book from that era, the character of a short Jewish newspaper man in the, in the old West, you know, somewhere in the heart of Texas, who finds true love, lives happily ever after? Would, would that oh, be asking definitely. too much? Definitely. What a hero! <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because I know women all over the all over the world are dying for that kind of guy to be their their romantic Western hero. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> so, uh, Tall, Dark, and Texan is the uh, third, uh, I think, and since it's a trilogy, I'm assuming the last book in the Whispering Mountain series. Was it was it hard to bring the story to a close? Um, it was. In fact, it was so hard that uh, I contracted for two more in the series about a month ago. <laughs> my first oh, trilogy right. was five books. My second trilogy was four books, and this one looks like this one's going to be five books. Uh, All right, somebody call on. somebody call in quickly who can count and explain. Trilogy is usually three books, <laughs> so that I'm not the one in the wrong here. <laughs> But uh, that, that 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 happens. I think your readers get a, they get attached to um, the characters, and they really want them to go on. They want the story to go on. I I understand that completely. Yeah, I I mean, uh, you know, I I uh, I read the book, and I I mean, I, I have to tell you, I mean, I, I greatly enjoyed the book, and I thought these are some great characters. I mean, who wouldn't want to, you know, see Jesse and Tegan? Uh, uh, move on with their lives and you know watch their kids grow up and and, and see what happens to uh, uh, Tegan's sister uh, Sage and I mean yeah it's a pretty rich uh, uh, group that you've got there. Well, the next story will be Sage and Drummond. So. What a surprise! <laughs> <laughs> it's different. What a surprise! And, uh, go back and tell me because I I you know I'll be honest I did not get to read the first two books. Uh, tell us a little bit. Obviously, don't give away anything that you know that would spoil it for people. But tell us a little bit how we kind of got to the point of the third book, uh, Tall, Dark, and Texan. Well, uh, the three stories are about three brothers who their parents were killed, and they have to hold the ranch until Tegan is old enough to claim the ranch in Texas. So, um, three little boys actually fought for their ranch when they were. Uh, 11, 12, and 6 years old. And hmm. the first story, Texas Rain, is about the 11-year-old that grew up to be a Texas Ranger. And it's about him coming home after two years. And um, he's a man now, and he's um, uh, and he's tired of fighting, and uh, he wants the peace of the ranch, and he gets home, and the ranch is in turmoil. So it's his story, and... The second one is about the little boy who was six when they had to become men, and uh, he actually was ambushed, and he um, he laid behind his horse, and his horse was killed, and they and they kept firing trying to reach him, and uh, he believed that his his blood mixed with the horses, so they raise horses, and he he doesn't like people, and he's afraid of people, and. Uh, mm. um, so his story is about him learning to to come out into the world, and of course he meets a, a woman who's very much very 
very much what we call a socialite today, and that's hard for him. <laughs> so uh, those were the first two brothers in their stories. And then when I got to Tegan, he was my oldest brother and the hardest one and the one that was hit hardest by the fact that no, no, nobody came to help him when the little boys were fighting. And so he doesn't like people. And <laughs> at the opening, he thinks he's being real friendly by just saying hello to a little widow he sees. And um, he's totally unprepared for what <laughs> for what happens in the book, for him him having to take uh, care of, of the widow and the three little children. He's totally unprepared for that. So it was a lot <laughs> of fun to write. It, um, I... You know, it's always hard to talk about these things without giving too much away. Uh, but the uh, the plot that 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 starts all this has to do with uh, this woman Jessie, who's back in Chicago, and she's. I guess is it safe to say she's almost been a victim all of her life. I mean, she's. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, great character. Uh, great characterization. Um, it, you know, when you when you do a story like this, is is there? You know, usually fiction has some root in truth. Is there is there anything, uh, you know, uh, truth like in any of this? Uh, either someone that you knew, or some something that you you studied, or some history I, that you picked up. I think in in the sense that, um, uh, sh- for me, in the sense that how she loved and found sanctuary in books. And from the beginning, uh, even when when she's homeless as a child, she runs to the bookstore to hide. And I mm-hmm. think uh, there are many of us who grew up loving libraries and loving bookstores, and I even love the smell of them. I love going in and just, <laughs> you know. And uh, I think that was her sanctuary. And then when she ends up in in an unhappy marriage, and is and like it, a lot of women in the 1800s, she feels trapped in that unhappy marriage. She dreams of this place called Whispering Mountain, and by letters she corresponds. And in a real way, she kind of lives her imaginary life already at at Whispering Mountain, even before she gets there. Mm. It's a uh, <laughs> it's it's an amazing difference in a, a, I don't know a hundred years, whatever. However, I don't. What, what year is the story set? Uh, 1858. Okay, so 150 years. Uh-huh. Um, the idea that uh, uh, you know it's really hard for us in this internet age to, to grasp that you know letters would go back and forth and people would know so much and tell so much in a letter, and that would be their only contact. And you know this woman, uh, again, I, I, I hesitate to give too much away, <laughs> but it, it, and it's 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 just this uh, this whole world that we can barely imagine anymore, and uh, it you know you you. You buy it. You buy a hook, line, and sinker here. Um, uh, let me. Uh, I know we've got some people listening to us uh, live right now. I imagine there are some fans of yours who might have some questions. So if you'd like to call in and uh, talk to Jody, uh, Jody Thomas, author of uh, two new books, uh, the most recent Tall, Dark, and Texan, and, of course, uh, the more contemporary uh, Twisted Creek, give us a call at 646-595-3135. Love to have you uh, on the line. Um, how much research do you have to do for one of these books, or is it all you know from <laughs> whole cloth? Well, it, it helps that I'm uh, uh, five generations in Texas, and mm-hmm. uh, uh, my my family's always loved Texas history, and and I grew up loving Texas history, and Texas history is so rich in. Um, the good guys and the bad guys, you know, and uh, so so I do um, I do quite a bit of research. I actually go to the location, even even in the case of Whispering Mountain, it was a ranch, and I knew exactly where it was set on the Guadalupe and how the river and and um, how it was going to work. So I like to walk the land. I I read everything I can about early Texas. Unfortunately. Uh, early Texas Texans were great fighters, but they weren't great writers. They didn't write, <laughs> and so. Uh, but uh, I also grew up with stories, uh, stories of ranching and and uh, in early Texas. So that helped some too. Huh. Um, tell me a little bit about Tegan, uh, the lead uh, male character. How how has he evolved over the three books and? And did he wind up any different uh, 
uh, then at, 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 at the end of this book than you imagined he would? He did. He really did. I, and, and that happens to my characters. They all kind of change. At the first book, um, he's he very much sees himself as the head of the family, and uh, everybody's almost a little afraid of him. And then as through the two, first two books, he realizes how much his brothers have grown up and how they're, they're, they're equal equal partners in this ranch. And uh, in the first two books, he's... Uh, his role is really the the head of the family. Uh, in this book, he um, he's never shared himself with anyone, and uh, to be to have to talk to her and and the fascinating thing is he's always kind of bullied people, and they're always a little afraid of him. And she's not afraid of him at all because she's grown up reading his letters, and he wrote the bookstore every you know three times a year and she's grown up reading his letters and in his letters he kind of told his hopes and dreams and fears and she she got the chance to to see those before she saw the man so he doesn't frighten her and the three little girls just fascinate him he just (laughs) he's he's amazed by them (laughs) that that is funny because of course his own uh his sister did not get to grow up in a in a kind of a little girl way so i I guess that has something to do with his fascination with the little girls um he he, he's a guy who really took pride in really kind of scaring people and and putting (laughs) people off well and that Uh, was his defense in keeping them at arm's length right but he uh it definitely seems to have been a hole in this guy's heart Uh, I like, uh, you know, I feel like people are people. It doesn't matter if you're writing a historical or a contemporary, and I've written both mainstream fiction contemporaries and historicals, and I think people are people, and I love crawling in inside of their minds and really taking a look at what makes them tick. And uh, let's talk about Jessie. Uh, she, you know, they both have... Um, socially, even even for 1858, was it? Um, they they both have some social uh, issues <laughs> uh, and lack of experience. Uh, tell us a little more about Jessie and you know where she's kind of coming from and what kind of person she is. Oh, okay. She came from educated parents, and she was an only child, and uh, her parents died leaving her basically on the streets uh and uh she begins to hide out in in a little bookstore where her her father used to take her and um the man who runs the bookstore um notices her one night and gives her a job and from that job she be- slowly begins to take over the bookstore because he uh He's he 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 likes to drink and uh, eventually mm-hmm. they marry and just because it was convenient for them to marry mm-hmm. and uh, um, she's it, she's just kind of for a widow with three children she's very inexperienced in a lot of ways of what goes on in the world and uh, uh, and I think her only friend has always been taken in through his letters and uh, because. She's begin to read the letters even when she was first first when she first comes to the bookstore. Mm. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. But but I, it was fun because she hadn't been west, and what she was seeing, uh, the things she saw, was like seeing through the first time. You know, uh, mm-hmm. what what the what Texas would have been like back then. Mm. Um, the. Uh, yeah, the journey uh, from place to place, and then of course, well, you know, I, I, boy, this is this is so tough to talk about a book when you don't want to give things away. Um, <laughs> there are a few surprises in it. <laughs> there are, there are. Um, how, how do you deal um, with uh, uh, deciding how much is enough and how much is too much on the the sexuality side? I mean, it, the, the books are rom- It's, I mean, it's a romance novel, but. Uh, not, not in the sense that it's very, uh, it's, it's not terribly sexual in, in a sense by right. today's standards. Well, I kind of see it as I'm, I, I'm writing the story of two people's lives, and this is their life story. This is 
the story of how they are. And I think you have to include the the sexuality is part of of the way they relate to each other. And uh, I think you have to include that. And um, otherwise you wouldn't be writing their whole story. But I don't include... um, I don't include a lot of graphic. <laughs> yeah. I I, someone told me once that uh, don't put too many breasts and thighs in there, or they'll think it's uh, Kentucky Fried Chicken. <laughs> <laughs> really <laughs> interesting. All right. So you have to be careful of uh, and make it make even the love scenes love scenes and make them romance, yeah, not uh, not graphic scenes. Mm. And I try really hard to do that. Uh, um, it's it comes it comes with the story it comes natural with the story mm-hmm. now i know i'm not the target audience for books like this <laughs> i i'm tickled that you read it that's wonderful i did. oh absolutely listen listen it, it, to me if 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 you're going to come on the show and we're going to we're going to talk for 30 45 minutes whatever it's going to be uh, i'm going to read the book i you know and and if i if you know god forbid i i I can't read the book because it's unreadable. Well, you know, I, I'm not going to, I'm not going to lie about it. But I, I read the book. I actually read it very quickly. It, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's, 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 it's fun. I, I uh, you know, can I, can I say that it's kind of like, uh, it's like a piece of candy. You know, it, it, it's, <laughs> it's, it's, it's sweet and it, 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 it's very easy to consume. And uh, you know, you want to get to the, to the end of it. So. Okay. Uh, I kind of see my target audience as, as um, you know, I, I always say the nurse that's sitting on the night shift or the teacher who gets home after a long day and, and she just wants to escape. And uh, she wants to be entertained. She wants to go on an adventure. And I'm just going to take her on that adventure with me, uh, these people. And I don't, you know, I, I um, I'm not trying to prove anything. I'm just trying to... To give someone some hours of enjoyment, and uh, um, I'm not going to stop them. Uh, you know, I don't want to stop them during the book. I want. I, I love it when my read, readers say, "I stayed up all night finishing your book. I just couldn't <laughs> put it down." Because that's <laughs> that's uh, that's a real compliment to me. Yeah. What's the strangest thing one of your fans has said to you about one of your books? <laughs> I think uh, the other day uh, I got an email from a, from a lady, and she said, I didn't buy your book. Someone gave it to me, but I loved it. I read it. I loved your characters, and she went on and on about that. And then she said, but what happened to um, uh, what happened to these two people afterwards? Did they have any kids? How long did they live? Did they ever move to here? Did, did, you know, and she began to ask me questions about... Um, all the characters and how long they lived and you know and uh, I laughed and I almost wrote back and said you didn't buy the book I'm not going to tell you <laughs> but, <laughs> but I thought no that would be cruel but in truth, <laughs> it really touched me that my characters came so alive that she thought that they you know that they went on and and had kids after the book ended you know and so that was a real compliment and uh, hmm. Um, in truth, those characters are very much alive to me. I mean, I'm walking around talking to them some days here in my office, and mm. uh, they're very alive. I think, I think I always worry that I'll accidentally walk out of my office. I'm on the second floor of uh, Cornet Library on the West Texas A&M campus, and I'm always mm. afraid I'm going to walk out of my office and still be talking to my characters. <laughs> 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 and they'll say, there goes the crazy writer in residence again. <laughs> <laughs> and the second time, they're going to call somebody. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> but I'm on a university car- a campus, so, you know, they're expecting, I think. Uh, they, there's a lot of characters walking around here. <laughs> certain eccentricity uh, accepted. That's right. Uh, That's wonderful. Now, did did stories like this really happen in the Old West? Oh, yes, yes. And a lot of times... Uh, uh, there'll be a thread in the story that is that's that's true that uh, uh, has been a story told to me from someone's ancestors, and uh, so there'll be a there'll there'll be something that's true. The parts I write about the Texas Rangers were often parts, and and a lot of people saw that 
a lot of people outside of Texas see the Texas Rangers as a person who dedicated their life to law enforcement. And in truth, in the early days, a lot of men took took their turn at six months or a year as a Texas Ranger. It was mm-hmm. a, it was a very common. T- in fact, uh, some of uh, the Western writers say Texas uh, Ranger wasn't capitalized for years because a Ranger was someone who rode the range. And, uh-huh. and so they were very, you know, um, and they were they were protection, but uh, uh, a lot of men took their turns as rangers mm. in those very early days. Interesting. So, and the the uh, part about the horses and the um, you know some of that comes from my background, so mm. and, and stories I've been told. Do you ride? I did. I uh, took a bad fall years ago, and now I don't ride. <laughs> uh. But I did. Uh, uh, in in fact, when I was a kid, my uncle was uh, president of a rodeo association, and my my big ride every every night at the rodeo was to ride out and give the awards to the winners. <laughs> <laughs> so, but uh, uh, I yeah I I do, and and I think. Um, or, or I have in, in years past, but now I'm a little bit, little bit skittish. I took uh, riding um, at the university a few years ago just to refresh. Uh, I took the equestrian course just to refresh so I, uh, my knowledge of horses. And it was, it was a fun course to take, and, and I think the students were, they were interested when I walked out. They weren't expecting somebody to step out and. Uh, I was the only one there, not 18 or 19. <laughs> oh. All right. <laughs> that was interesting. Right. Well, if you've got a uh, question or comment for Jenny Thomas, author of uh, Tall, Dark, and Texan, and uh, also recently uh, Twisted Creek, give us a call, 646-595-3135. Uh, we're, we've got a little more time here. We're going to talk. Um, someone reading your books probably thinks you've either got a very active romantic life or a very active fantasy life. <laughs> which, which would it be? Uh, I have been very happily married to the same man for 38 years. <laughs> so <Yeah>. fantasy life. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but uh, I, uh, uh, every once in a while, a fan will come up and uh, someone will say, "Do you want to meet Jody Thomas?" And they'll say, "No, I want to meet her husband." <laughs> Oh, really? <laughs> you know? interesting. But uh, uh, I, uh, I think uh, I, I think I read a lot. I, I, from the very beginning, when I first started reading, I've always loved historical romance, and mm. uh, um, and I think that the um, what I'm writing about the story, the love story of a kind of love that um, that can last, you know. Through a lifetime, I think I think that's something um, we all want. We all want to happen, and uh, mm-hmm. so I uh, I think that kind of commitment. And uh, it's and the wonderful thing about writing historicals is is um, you know the the lifespan was so short. You, you know, a love for a lifetime wasn't that long. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Not a lot of 38-year marriages in that period of time. No, no, not a lot. <laughs> but I, uh, that's fine. I that feel like fun. I should... Fo- I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I, I was going to say, I feel like I should follow up on that person who said, I don't want to meet Jody. I want to meet her husband and ask you about your husband. Uh, what What is he like? What does he do? <laughs> he actually is a teacher. He teaches. And uh, uh, he uh, has been uh, for 14 years now. He's been a teacher, and uh, uh, he's uh, the first uh, probably six or seven books. If you read them, you would see a trait of my husband in him. Uh, he's uh, quiet, and uh, you know he's uh, definitely a person of his word, and all of that. You know, you'd see his characteristics in my heroes were definitely characteristics in him. And uh, when I started writing, Thomas is actually a pen name, and uh, uh, I'm married to Thomas, so that means ah. I took his first name as my pen name. So is he a romantic guy? That's what people really want to know. <laughs> I think yes. I think he's 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 a fairly romantic guy. Yes, uh, uh, as 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 much as we all uh, today, you know, in the 
in the busy days, I think he definitely would, would be classified as a romantic guy. And he doesn't, um, he reads um, the openings to my books and the synopsis, but he usually doesn't read the entire book. And uh, a lot of people think that that's strange, but um, I, I think he, he's very supportive. From the very beginning when I wanted to write, uh, he, he said, uh, I said, I can't find the time. I can't find enough hours to write. And he said, well, put the kids to bed. You go write. I'll do the dishes. And there were a lot of nights that I didn't have anything to write, but I sure didn't want to do the dishes. So, <laughs> <laughs> so I'd stay in my study and not come out. <laughs> but uh, he, So I think that helped. I think that kind of belief in me uh, really pushed me to, to keep writing. Hmm. Oh, that's nice. I uh, I don't write fiction, but I do write nonfiction books, and I can tell you that my wife uh, read the first two, and uh, we decided we would never do that again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, it, I think it, it uh, that that can be a very solid solid idea for a marriage. <laughs> yeah, you know, there's I, people outside of that situation probably wouldn't see see that as an issue, but you know. When you're writing, and it's it, even if, even if it's nonfiction, it's personal to you. And the last thing you want is the person that you're going to bed with every night to be critical of that. Because it's just so it's better to keep a little separation. I I, I think I can I can kind of see that. Um, now, now in my contemporaries, he helps me do some of the research too. Ah, well, yeah. I'll, let me ask you one more question about him, and then we'll. We'll stop embarrassing the poor guy, but what is the most romantic thing that he has done in 38 years of marriage, besides, you know, take the dishes on? <laughs> um, actually, when I'd written five, I think this is, oh, there's there's many, many. Uh, he's a very practical romantic. I, uh, I remember for our <laughs> diamond anniversary, he bought me diamond shamrock stock. <laughs> oh. Not not a diamond, but uh, he... Um, um he had he had a um after five books he had an artist uh he commissioned an artist to do a painting of one of the scenes in my book in my book mm. and inside the book it was a study were books and the books on the shelf of this 18th century uh drawing room were my books and i thought that was oh. so that was that's that's pretty nice. <laughs> Sounds like a pretty good guy. <laughs> he is. He's a good guy. <laughs> All right. So, a tall, dark, and Texan set in the past, Twisted Creek, which came out, I think, in April of 08. Uh, it, it's more of a contemporary story. How do you go back and forth so smoothly? It really, I, I thought I would have a problem with it, but in truth, by the time I finish a historical, I'm already making notes all over and sticking them up on my wall of uh, notes for the contemporary. And I think it, it's kind of like switching channels on your two favorite TV shows or something because I switch into the contemporary and and uh, and I'm ready for it by the time I have lived in the past for six months. Mm. And Twisted Creek was just a story I... I really, I I had thought about writing for a year, and and by the time I got to it, I had uh, tons of notes. I wanted to write a, a story of a woman who believed bad luck stalked her, that if it was possible for bad luck to happen, it would happen. Mm. And good luck starts to happen to her when good things start to happen to her. Um, she's kind of unprepared. She's so used to she's. So, so used to things flying in her direction that when something comes positive, it, it's hard for her. Mm. This, this, of course, is your character, Allie. And uh -huh. uh, in the book, the book actually starts that way. It starts off, if, if rotten luck were a man, I'd have a stalker. I, I had to stop and think about that for a minute. That was pretty <laughs> interesting. There was one other, there was another thing, uh, actually, in the first couple pages that I liked. Let me see. It's like... I dog-eared the page. I didn't actually write in the book because I try not to do that. Um, what was the line? Um, uh, oh, yeah, this was, uh, <laughs> this was cold. Uh, 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 Nana had my mother during her change of life, and my mother had me at 15 with half the freshman... <laughs> oh, God, I can't believe I'm reading this. 
with half the freshman football team denying ever having known Carla Daniels and the other half smiling. I thought, wow, where's this going? <laughs> oh, my goodness. Uh, uh, it was fun. This this book, I wanted to tell a story of a, of a community that formed, and she, they, um, Allie inherits a uh, lake house, and she gets all excited, but she knows it's a mistake because she doesn't have an Uncle Jefferson, and she's inherited this lake house from her Uncle Jefferson, and her grandmother and her go there just knowing that that it's a lie that she doesn't have an Uncle Jefferson, but they're so desperate because. Luck has they, their luck has been so bad. They're so desperate that they take this lake house, and they get there, and they're expecting you know a house on the lake. And what they get is one of these old rundown shacks where they sell bait and sandwiches and you know uh, fishing license and stuff like that. And when Allie takes one look at it, um, inside her thoughts she says. Um, for her, this is Halloween night, and she looks over, and her grandmother, who had the happiest time of her life at a lake, for her mm. grandmother, this is Christmas morning. She just sees it as wonderful. So Allie slowly begins to see this rundown place through her grandmother's eyes, and her grandmother is so accepting of people and. I call them the nesters. They're the people that stay at the lake during the winter when everybody else goes home. And they're, they, they, none of them fit in society. And the grandmother accepts them without judgment. And slowly they become uh, a community and mm-hmm. a community of, of, of people that, that work together and, uh, and go through hard times together and it's uh it's really the story of community and i think it was interesting this book has done very very well uh and i think it's in print third printing already and wow uh, so and my editor said you you've created what a lot of people don't have some people are living in apartments or in houses where they don't even know their neighbors they don't know the person down the hall and this book creates a community and that's what we all want to live in a community hmm. how much uh, input do you get from an editor on a book like this um, on this particular book um, uh, I whenever once it sold once the proposal was written and it sold I turned it in and uh, I had no rewrites none hmm. uh, but with some books it, I go through three or four months of changing and, and the editor saying, bring this character out more, you know, push this back to a subplot, that kind of thing. But uh, with this book, I had no write, rewrites, and with Tegan's story, I had no rewrites. And that's only happened twice, and it's the two books I have out this year. Hmm. So. Um, what was I going to ask you about? Um, is, it, is it easier to write in the present? in the past? Actually, it's harder for me. And I think it's because I have to check, because, you know, uh, I don't know a lot of things. In the past, you can feel like you've got a grip on what they did. You know, once you do the research, you've got the grip. And after 20 books set in the past, I kind of feel like, I'm, I, you know, I know how to make butter and how biscuits are done and how, you know, how to tame a horse and all kinds of stuff. But in... In a in a contemporary, you have to do research. You know, uh, for example, if you have someone hurt in Austin, you have to know which hospital takes them and what the procedure is, and you know, uh, all that kind of kind of stuff. So mm-hmm. you have to you have to know a lot more. Uh, a few years ago, I wrote a book set in Austin with the homeless, and I actually had to go down there and do research and walk the streets and and really see what it was like to be homeless. Do you um, uh, do you have any journalism training, any, any research training? Uh, I took some journalism classes in college. Uh, then um, 
before I, I worked on my master's, I, I took correspondence courses. I took one out of OU that's considered one of the best in graduate level in creative writing. And hmm. then uh, um, uh, and then my degree is actually in marriage and family counseling. And, really? Yeah. Uh-huh. And uh, uh, my specialty was crisis counseling. And I loved it. Um, I love doing it, but I love stepping into fiction more. <laughs> <laughs> eventually. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I can understand that. Um, when when you're de- and now I uh, I gather that you're out and about uh, promoting this book, probably doing some bookstores and other things. Yeah. Um, what do your fans most want to know about you? Now I was teasing about your husband before, just uh, <laughs> you know because you're writing romance. But what do your fans want to want to know about you? What do they want to talk about the most? Um. A lot of them want to know my daily schedule. You know, what do, how do I, how do I write uh, during the day? You know, when do I write? And I started out um, at first, of course, like all writers. I had another job, and I was trying to be a writer at night. And so I started out writing at night. And to this day, even 20 years later, my most creative time is probably between eight or nine o'clock and midnight. I can get more pages turned out then than if I work all day. And uh, they want to know my schedule. Uh, they also want to know where the ideas come from. And that's really hard because, and I think it's hard for for everybody. Sometimes the ideas come in just a line somebody says uh, or a line from a song or something I see in a museum um, and I hang out at every museum and and just just one thing that I see um in Whispering Mountain the idea came because uh the boy's mother the mo- mother was Apache and they they this land there's a legend there that if you sleep on the summit of Whispering Mountain you dream your future and in each book each man has to think about whether or not he would go up there and would want to see his future you know, if he could dream it, do you really want to see it? And uh, because their father dreamed his death, and so they think that there's that possibility they could be dreaming their death. And so I think each thing, there's one thing that sort of begins a story, and it's like a seed, and all of a sudden the, the whole story comes. And once in a while, something will happen in a story that that surprises me. Uh, I... Um, Several years ago, this happened, and my husband tells me I should never tell people this happens. And, but uh, one night I was working, it was probably 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning, and I was laughing, and I woke him up. And he got up and came in my study, and he said, what are you laughing at? And I said, Grayson, who was one of my characters, just told me a joke I hadn't heard. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <Ooh>, scary. <laughs> but sometimes your characters become, it's almost like you're talking to them as you're writing them. And... Uh, uh, sometimes they they develop a personality, and once you mold that personality, they they actually stand up to you and say, "No, that's not in my personality. I'm not going to do that." But um, but they, it begins with just just a little line or a little hint, or sometimes something I touch um, in museums all across the West. I will stop and I'll say to the people, "I'm a writer." If you'll give me a dust rag, I'll dust this room, but I want to touch the stuff. And a lot of times people will hand me a dust rag and I'll just step into a dugout from 1850 and I'll begin to just handle the things and look at them and how did they feel and what were they like. And sometimes Hmm. the story comes from that. Hmm. Do uh, many of your fans... uh do they want to tell you their idea for a story or their own story, perhaps if they're from Texas, so you can either write it into a book or, or maybe they want advice so that they can be just like you? That's uh, that's probably the the second most common person that comes up to you calling yeah. and autographing, someone who says, I have a story. And sometimes they say, I'll tell it to you and we'll split the money. And <laughs> I always say, how about I tell you where to take a writing course and you keep all the money, you know. <laughs> and, uh and sometimes they just want to tell me a family story, and I love that. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't like it when they come and want to tell me the story of their life, because oftentimes it's something that um, 
they could write very effectively, but I probably couldn't, you know. Mm. So that's tough. But uh, I've heard so, I've heard some delightful stories, and 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 I love because I grew up listening to people tell stories. I I laugh and say I come from a long line of liars of men who <laughs> and women who would tell the stories, and the stories would get more interesting the more times they told them. And mm-hmm. so, so that's. Uh, uh, that form of storytelling, uh, and everybody knew it was a story. So I like that. I like that when it comes through, through like that. Mm. And, but I uh, I could never write anybody else's story, you know. And I have more stories than I will ever have time to write in my head. And uh, uh, I I keep a book, and I have since before I sold, and it's and it's got on the spine, idea book, and I'll have an idea for a story, and I'll write it on a page of that book and stick it back behind my desk, and I have never pulled that book out looking for an idea, mm. because the ideas are, there's too many there that I haven't written down, so uh, I, th- I figure I have time to write another 30 books. <laughs> there you go. Yep. Well, and and that that feeds into my very last question for you. What's next? What do you have coming up next? Obviously, you, you started the conversation today by by telling us that you've signed on to do uh, a five part trilogy now, uh, the two more books in the Whispering Mountain series. But um, what's uh, what's the next book, and what's what's ahead of that? What's beyond that? Uh, the next historical will be out a year from now, and it'll be Sage's story, who was the little girl born whenever they were defending the ranch and uh, mm-hmm. um it'll be her story and it's going to it's going to be a lot of humor in 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 that story and then my next um uh, uh women's fiction will be out in April 1st and it's going to be called Rewriting Monday and it's about a small town newspaper surviving in a little town and a a big city um a reporter who gets stuck in this little town and decides to to spend her time being a reporter for this small town newspaper. Oh, I hope this is the one that includes the short Jewish newspaper, man. That we oh, talked definitely. about it. <laughs> uh, you know, Jody, I just we're just about to wrap up, but I, I, there may be a call here for you. Let's let's just give a listen and see. Hi, do you have a, a question or comment for Jody Thomas? Hello. Uh, apparently not. Well, okay. <laughs> Go to all the trouble of calling in. I don't know. Um, well, uh, uh, folks, you can uh, you can find either of Jody Thomas's latest books, uh, Tall, Dark, and Texan from the Whispering Mountain series, or Twisted Creek, uh, f- uh, which is more contemporary, from fine bookstores everywhere, or order them online at Amazon.com or right here at MRMedia.com. You can also learn more about Jody at her website, and that is Jody J O D I Thomas. JodyThomas.com, where you can also see a video tease for Tall, Dark, and Texan. Uh, Jody, thanks so much for joining us on Mr. Media today, and I hope you'll come back again in the future. Well, thank you very much. I enjoyed it. Same here. All right. Take care. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Folks, for, <laughs> for dozens more celebrity and media newsmaker interviews, surf over to our main website, www.mrmedia.com. That's where you can listen to my earlier conversations with Billy Bob Thornton, Cheryl Hines, Jeff Garland, Robert Schimmel, Bruce Davison, and even Kirk Douglas, among many, many others. Please think about writing an online review of Mr. Media, casting a vote for Mr. Media, or marking Mr. Media as one of your favorites. That's whether you listen on Blog Talk Radio, DigitalJournal.com, Podcast Pickle, Vox, Folio, Mediafly, Podfeed.net, Blueberry, Zencast, Audio, Kindle, the Kindle Reader, or iTunes. And if you've got an idea for a guest, email me directly at bob at andelman, A-N-D-E-L-M-A-N dot com. Thanks so much for joining us today. As you know, regulars you know, regulars, irregulars you don't know, I appreciate when you take a little bit of time out of your day and spend it with us. Come on back real soon, everybody.